you may already be familiar with the humble Linksys home networking tower of power. But there are enterprise equivalents. Here we've got two Cisco PIX 515E firewalls from 2002. A firewall is meant to, of course, block unwanted incoming traffic coming into your local area networks, and these have a very interesting failover capability. The backs of these units have some modules that accept a high-speed serial cable port, which allows a primary to go down and fail over traffic responsibility to the secondary. I know both of these work because I got them running in a previous video, but I never got to the failover because I had flashed this secondary into a bad state where it could no longer boot. With some help from commenters and a patron named Sven, we were able to find the right utility to flash this and fix it up. We're in good condition now. We'll try getting failover configured and ripping the power cord out of the primary to see what happens. On our journey to PIX high availability goodness, we'll throw in this Cisco 2600 series router, see what that's all about, came out in 1998, and this monster Cisco Fast Hub from 1996. Let's get into it. Let's see what we've got in this stack here. A Cisco 2600 series modular router, a 2610 to be specific. This is the bottom of the barrel. This came out in 1998. From what I'm seeing online, this guy or the model just above it would have cost you 2,700 to 7,500 US dollars back in 1998 list price. That's something like $5,100 to $14,000 USD here in 2024. This isn't all that useful yet, as we'll see when we dive in and take a look around back. Down here, we've got a hub. This is a Cisco Fast Hub 316T, also 1998. As far as I can tell, I know for sure this unit was built in 1998. It's interesting that it has a different design scheme than this 2600, theoretically from the very same year. So maybe they were transitioning over and then the picks that we'll get to in a second at the bottom look just like the 2600. So yeah, Cisco must have been transitioning out this older looking design. And then of course at the bottom, We've got a pair of Cisco PIX 515E firewalls. These are identical units. In a previous video, I got these up and running. They're working great. And I wanted to try doing some failover. So you can set one of these up as a primary. You can see in a prior life, these were both secondaries. So there were a couple more that used to live with these guys. There's a high speed serial connect on the back and you can use that to set up a primary. And when the primary loses power or otherwise malfunctions, It'll fail over to the secondary in a few seconds. And there was another way documented that I want to try. These both have four extra NICs in addition to their default two. And you can use those to get these on the same network with a hub. I haven't owned a hub in like 20 years. And so I thought, what's the most ridiculous hub I can buy? And this is where I ended up. So I know the PIX units are working just fine, but I've never powered these up. We'll start by exploring this 2610, seeing what it's all about. And then we'll move on to the hub, get it cleaned up. It's a little banged up, so we got to do a little repair work there. And then we'll see if we can get some failover going. This Cisco 2600 series of modular routers is pretty iconic. You might even recognize this, even if you aren't in the industry or do any of this. I know I did for some reason, even though, you know, I don't have any professional networking experience, certainly not from the early 2000s. And again, this guy came out in 1998. And we can see that the PIX firewall from 02, I think this one's from, identical form factor right down to the cases on the top you can see they both have these indents for pushing the lid off and if we flip them over we can see it's the same case same fan location now i don't think the pix is necessarily considered part of the 2600 modular series but i do like that they kept the form factor the same obviously when you stack them up and rack them up they look great on the back of the lid we can see fill these slots with functionality and the cisco website and it says peel off and save to use the URL. Looks like someone tried and gave up. We'll be leaving that there. On the back, of course, power in. We've got an auxiliary RJ45. That's for like remote connection, probably to a modem or something for remote management. The console port for local management. This is a serial cable that connects up here over RJ45. And then the single 10 bit ethernet port. One of the reasons this isn't entirely useful at the moment. And we've got two, what are called WICs or Wix, maybe you say that, WAN interface cards here. The WAN being wide area network. These are set up for T1, DSU, CSU, so T1 in. This will be your least T1 line coming from your ISP. This guy was probably set up for two redundant lines in case one went down for whatever business this was servicing. Now, obviously, I can't really take advantage of these T1 connections at the moment, but we are starting to get some T1 gear piling up here. So we'll be diving into that over the course of the year. 
I remember when I was in junior high, I only had dial up at home and the school had a, several T1 lines. And man, I thought that was like the fastest thing I'd ever seen. And here I am messing around in my basement with T1 equipment that was probably mind bogglingly expensive when it came out. So these are modular. You can have different types of WAN interface cards in here. This one just happens to be set up for T1. And this one's a little rusted, but you know, that's no big deal. I knew I was on the hunt for one of these 2600 series routers and that they took these modular wicks. Uh, Cisco just has so many buddies that we can hang out with and learn from. So yeah, we've got this new one and it must be quite a bit newer. <laughs> Look at the differences there. To my knowledge, these are equivalent T1 DSU CSUs. This one must be quite a bit newer just on the surface looking at it. It's unfortunately doesn't have our Industry Canada stickers. Sorry, folks. Slightly different connector. I wonder if I bought one that is for a newer router. Let's find out. Ignore everything I just said. This is clearly for a different router. Guess I'll have to buy that one too. <laughs> yeah, this is for six other series of Cisco routers, none of which are the 2600. Clearly inspired by though, <laughs> nearly identical. That's funny. That almost makes me feel better. Clearly I don't need three T1 DSU CSUs for the 2600 series of routers. This blinking plate comes off and more modularity is to be found. I'm gonna get a fast ethernet module here so that I can use this as a proper router and connect stuff up to it. Normally I wouldn't really bother taking this all the way apart. It looks pretty clean, but there's, I can hear something rattling around in there. If it's like the picks, you have to take these ears off just like that. Just a few screws on the top here. And then as easy as that, I see our culprit right away. Piece of plastic. That'll be a piece of one of the plastic front clips, but it doesn't seem bad enough to have done any significant damage. Yeah, there's more. This little slip usually belongs to the lid connecting to the back of the case or something like right here. Get you a slightly closer look at the board here. I am seeing 2000 date codes. So this model came out in 98. This particular unit appears to have been built in the year 2000. 24 years old this year. You can see we've got some sort of riser for additional functionality. This is interesting. There's an edge connector way over here, which looks like it's been soldered to or something. It's kind of interesting. Down in here, you can see the larger expansion module connector and back in there, connectors for the WAN cards. Well, I don't see anything concerning. So I'm gonna button this back up and we'll try to talk to it over the serial console. I don't know what it's like now, what modern Cisco gear looks like, but this older stuff is just really high quality. The cases are really hefty. This looks like a nice power supply. The board is really well laid out, really nice looking. I mean, everything's just really high quality. You can tell that copper piece I pulled out that was rattling around goes here. I think I'm missing one, but that's no big deal. We got our RJ45 to serial console cable hooked up. Let's give it a shot. We are connected to the serial console 9600 baud. I think that's right. Let's give it power. Fans, lights, serial console. All right, system bootstrap, 1999 Cisco systems. Let's see what happens. We might have to reset the password and that might be as far as we go here because I can't really use it until more of the modules come for more ethernet since it only has that one NIC. We're running iOS version 12.1 from 2001, looks like. I always like this. You get the LDAP or, you know, internal username of the Cisco employee that happens to have compiled the version of the software you're running on your router. Let's see here. Username. Let's try Cisco. Nothing. Let's try Cisco, Cisco. Nothing. This is interesting. A custom message of the day. PHH Corporation owns this device. Well, this clearly hasn't been wiped. Let me look up the password reset procedure. If you have some access to the router, you're supposed to be able to type show version. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to do that. I can't get past this username prompt. And then you're supposed to, this thing just spits stuff out at you all the time. It's up to stuff. Show version is supposed to show you a configuration register. And then you can boot to something called the ROM mon and use that register to reset the configuration. 
If you don't have access like me, it claims I can use a particular register, so we'll do that. So we're supposed to power it off, turn it back on, and within 60 seconds of boot up, hit the brake key. Let's see if it listens. It is not, I might have to do something funny to send it the brake key <laughs> for the serial console. Let's see. We've got 32 megs of memory. That's pretty good. No, no. All right, I gotta Google how to send a break in putty. If you Google putty how to send break, the first result is, how do you send break on a putty to a Cisco 2600? <laughs> okay, rebooting. Right click, special command, break. Please work. Oh, there we go. If you break while it's decompressing the image, it seems to work. Okay, we are in ROMMON. We're supposed to type conf reg x2142. Okay, and then we type reset. It's going to reset the router. So this should reboot the router, but it's going to ignore all of its configuration, and we should end up at a router prompt. All right, we're in the default setup. I can just control C out of this, I think. All right, we're in. Here's the router prompt, so it skipped all its password configuration. We're going to type enable to get to privilege mode. That's what this pound means. And then we're going to type write terminal, and it should dump out its whole config, which should either let us look at the passwords or see if there's an encrypted one. Maybe that's what I'm looking at here. Service password encryption. I don't know. Well, anyway, configure terminal, enable secret club retro. I think it had a password, but it had a reset config because usually I'd be seeing the configuration with all the interfaces and all that, and I'm not really seeing anything that had previously been set up. So maybe just the username and password were still there. So then I'm gonna do a copy running config startup config. And if I do a show version now, we can see that weird config register it needed was correct. Well, let's do a cold restart and see if it kept my settings. I've never used iOS, by the way. Yeah, we're in. This is great. Let's try to enable. It should be Cloud Retro as the password. It is. Okay, this thing's fully reset. That's great. PHH is a large US-based mortgage company. Boring. Oh, I was going to type in here and tell them about the router, but I've only got hard-coded options. Thanks a lot, Mort. I'm very happy this thing works, and I've got the password reset. Someday I'll play around with the T1 uplinks, just locally here. Maybe we'll use this later. When we're making a network for the PIX failover, I guess I could just have this be the router and it doesn't have internet access or something. This will be a lot more useful when the module comes in here. I think it's got eight or 16 or something fast ethernet ports. And then I can actually use this thing to uh, build out larger networks down here with. That'll be fun. Now let's move on to the star of the show. In my opinion, just look at this thing. This is a Cisco Fast Hub 316T, not part of the 2600 series, but modular in its own right. Theoretically, this expansion port for 16 more ports on the hub is hot swappable. So you can throw this bad boy in when it's running and get 16 more ports. We will definitely be testing that. And mine also has this optional NMM or network management module, supposedly also hot swappable. This guy right here. You might be asking yourself like I was, why does a hub need management capabilities. Hubs are typically just like dumb repeaters. So for example, if we've got a computer on this one and a computer on this one, let's throw another one here for good measure. When this guy wants to talk to this guy, every single port gets the traffic. So this computer is also going to get that traffic, even though it's not meant to be for this computer and this computer doesn't care about it. All it does is it takes traffic in and repeats it on every single port except for the one it came in on. So to drive the point home, this black machine here is sending data to the blue machine. The white one's gonna get it. And in fact, all these ports are gonna get it. It's just a repeater. These aren't really as popular as they once were because as you can imagine, that's not the most efficient way to route traffic. A proper switch will actually take traffic in on this guy. And if it's meant for the blue cord, only the blue cord will get it. But if we start taking a look at the back, we start getting a hint here. We've got these down and uplink cables. These hubs can be stacked four at a time to add more ports to the network. And in order to do that, one of them must have one of those NMM modules. There's also a bridge module. I happen to have a network module, but you need one of those in one of these, and then you can link them all together, four in a stack. 
When I see a system that has modularity like this and optional incremental upgradability, I'm just like, hell yeah, I need four of these. I need to stack them. I need to see what this is like. So I might find myself picking more of these up for absolutely no reason other than to try it out. Like I think it's really cool when companies build ecosystems and this modular type strategy. I think it's really forward thinking. I think it's an engineering feat. And I think it's probably in the end good for the customer to be able to optionally upgrade what you want. I can't find any concrete information online about when this model came out, but I know mine for sure here was manufactured June 6th of 1998. So at least back to 98. And in a very blurry ad from InfoWorld in August of 98, we can see this unit would have been going for 1139 US dollars without any of those expansion modules adjusted for inflation, roughly 2100 US dollars. We also have a Rockwell Collins IT inventory label on the case. Rockwell Collins is an aerospace and defense industry type company. They didn't exist under that name until 2001. So we know it was used at least as late as that. This thing is pretty dirty, so we're going to take it all apart completely and clean it up a little bit. And I also hear something rattling around. It also had a little more damage on the right side here. This plastic piece here was missing in the eBay listing, and I think these were pretty banged up as well. But we might be able to glue that back together and get it on the side at the end here. But let's get these cards out. So we've got the network management module and then the hot swappable expansion bay. And here's a mystery for you. It says Cisco Systems 1996. I guess that answers my question. It's at least from 1996. <laughs> Masada Expansion Board. I can't find anything about Cisco Masada Expansion Boards. Is that the internal code name that Cisco is using or something? Here's the network management module. Masada Network Management Module, also 1996. Did they acquire a company that was making these or something? Really weird. Can't find anything about that. Looks like our best bet is these screws on the back. This thing has two fans. I bet it is reasonably loud. They look really dusty. That's another reason I want to do this. Looks like you could optionally have a DC input instead of the AC. So this thing is 26 years old. Always makes you wonder if you're the first one in here, you know, since it was built. I'm just rotating it around and pulling on it just to see how this lid comes off and there, there is so much stuff rolling around in there probably all the plastic from the front broken plate well i hope i'm not expected to take this off because it doesn't have much much left to give in it well folks i'm not sure it's as if the center part here on either side is glued or something and i don't want to risk bending this up if i don't need to or doing more damage to the front somehow. I was able to shake out all the plastic bits that were rattling in there, no metal, luckily, and some dust. So I guess what we'll do is I'll just blow it out with air and then I'll wipe down the front. Got another project going on the other side of the basement. I just started. That's gonna be a lot of work. But the good news is the air compressor's down here. Probably hard to tell, but it's better. Blew out all the dust with the air compressor, wiped it down with Windex all over. It's looking a lot better. It was, it was quite dirty. Let's see what we can do about this corner. These two pieces fit together just like that. So the first thing I'll do is super glue them, I think. Let that sit. Yeah, that looks a lot better. You almost don't notice that this top plate's missing. I suppose if you were to start this up without the optional network management module. It would just start up as a dumb hub and nothing special going on. And that's all I need it to do, but hopefully we can get something out of the serial console. That'd be interesting to see. It doesn't have a power switch as far as I can tell, so let's plug it in. Ooh, look at that. That was cool. These are LED indicators. It says stat, status maybe. And over here on the serial console, we've got nothing. I'm at 9,600 baud just as a guess. See if I can dig up some documentation. <laughs> just needed a null modem adapter. So when you connect two serial devices together directly, sometimes you need a null modem adapter to cross some wires so that the one transmitting can talk to the receiver. And anyway, simple fix. This thing is working. Look at this. I don't even know where to start. Let's look at system. Oh no. <laughs> PII. Uh, this is hub 3303. It belonged to Steven. 
<laughs> this is so cool. The location, room D330. IP configuration. Yeah, look at that. DNS, ps.collins.rockwell.com. Definitely belong to them. Wow, this is pretty sophisticated considering it is a hub. It can send all sorts of data over SNMP for management. That's very cool. I love playing around with serial management software, especially old stuff. Let's look at the stack Armand statistics report. Okay. Check this out. So I'm looking at the port stats. It knows it's got that top expansion module. Very cool. Let's look at, I don't know, port number 10. Statistics for each port. Yeah, this is a pretty serious, serious appliance. You can change the serial settings of the console port. It's pretty cool. This is where we would see, I guess, Mac addresses for whatever's plugged in. Let's plug something in. Got this little Lenovo plugged in to port two. Light came on. That's a good sign. I knew when I saw this thing, I was going to like it. And I tell you what, I love it. This thing is so cool. It's just a hub, but look how advanced it is. Okay, let's look at unit addressing. And there you have it, port two, MAC address. Now remember, hubs don't know IPs, but they can map MAC address to MAC address. Just incredible how fun it would have been to run this stuff. Okay, well, we need some more computers on this thing. Let's get this Windows XP machine hooked up here. Perfect time to tell you my hub story. So, I don't know, 2002. I had like an eight port hub and my gaming PC it wasn't nice. I don't remember what the PC was about and the hub sucked, of course. Cut out a slot for it and mounted it here. So it was kind of like this size, this is a switch, but you know, you'd take the case off this. You can imagine that's pretty small. And I slid it in there and mounted it somehow for LAN parties. Probably used it like three times. Anyway, I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. I wish I had a picture of that. I'm sure it was a total hack job that cut up threading a power cord in there somehow. Anyways, we'll get this machine going. And before we boot this back up, let's pull this module out. We'll make sure this network works and then we'll try plugging this in and putting this machine on it to see if it truly is hot swappable. You might be wondering like, how's this going to work? No router, no switch. This thing doesn't understand IPs. What's going on here? If you're a network noob like me, well, we're going to go back to basics. I suppose this guy and the Ubuntu machine are going to be on the same network. We'll make this one 192.168.120. That'll be dot 10. And basically we'll try to talk to the Ubuntu machine with this and the machines need Mac addresses to talk to each other. This one's not going to know anything about that one. What it's going to do is blast out something called an ARP request. So it's going to blast the whole network and say, Hey, which one of you is 192.168.1.10? The Ubuntu machine will respond and say, that's me. Here's my Mac address. Then this guy will know the Mac address and they'll start talking in theory. Let's try it out. See if I know what I'm talking about. This is the windows XP machine. And you can see we've got an IP address statically set at dot 20 and we can check our ARP table that I was talking about. So it says no ARP entries found. It doesn't know any IP to Mac address mappings right now. Dot 10 is the Ubuntu machine. Let's try to ping it. We're getting replies, which means if we look at the ARP table, because it did an ARP broadcast to the network and said, Hey, who out there is dot 10? Give me your Mac address. The Ubuntu machine responded back and said, Hey, that's me. Now this is cached for some period of time or whatever. So it doesn't have to do that all the time. And the same thing would happen the other direction or if we added more machines and try to get them talking to each other, as long as they're on the same subnet. Let's take a look at the hub, see what it's up to. So if we go to port statistics report, we can see it knows that expansion board is gone. That's good. And then if we go down to unit addressing report, no surprise here, our Ubuntu machine in port two and the XP machine we just hooked up in port eight. So in terms of picks failover and being able to create networks, this thing's working perfectly. That's what I wanted to validate. But now let's pull the Ubuntu machine off, plug the expansion board in while it's on, and then put the Ubuntu machine in one of those ports. First, we're just gonna pull the Ubuntu machine out. And now while it's on, we'll insert our hot swappable expansion module. Lights turned on. I think the fans kind of kicked up too. Let's get Ubuntu back online. Port 17 here, blinking. That's good. I didn't refresh this serial connection or anything. Let's see what this says. Interesting. It didn't like that. So it, it no longer knows about the XP machine, even though it's still plugged in. Interesting. 
A few moments later, it remembers the XP machine. Okay. I can still send traffic to the Ubuntu machine. So it's online, but the remote management doesn't know about it. Well, the network's working. Both computers can talk to each other, but the remote management software doesn't see it. It doesn't say anything special in the instructions. It says, go ahead and put that in there and plug a cable in. So I guess we'll just restart it. Sees them both now and all the ports after restart. I, I can't say it didn't work. I plugged it in there and the network was functioning just as it should. Just couldn't see it in here. So I guess that's cool. Good enough to use for our little failover network. I promise we're very close to actually doing what we came here for, which is trying to get these PIX units to fail over to one another. One being a primary, one being a secondary. But before we do that, I want to address something about this smaller PIX unit, this 506E here. This 506E reports itself as having a Pentium 2 processor. And I mentioned that in a video where I got this running and the other two bigger units we're gonna play with in a minute and didn't think much of it. But some viewers pointed out, Pentium 2 didn't come in this socket form factor. It was the larger card style connector. So that's pretty curious. I suspect what's under here is a Celeron, a very early Celeron, which was essentially a Pentium 2. So let's find out. That is on there. Am I gonna regret this? Whew. That was some old thermal paste. Okay, what do we got? The great reveal. This will take a moment. We're gonna let that soak in the good stuff and you're gonna have to wait till later in the video before we can read what that says. These are some PIX 515E firewall units from 2002. What we wanna do here today is get this one configured as a primary with some computers on a network, leveraging it and actually going out to the internet through my existing home network. This one's gonna be a secondary primary failover and we should be able to pull the power on this one and a few moments later, all the traffic on the network should be able to flow through the secondary. This can work in a number of ways. We've got this fast serial connection, high-speed serial connection with a special Cisco cable. That's what we're gonna try first. The ends actually matter. They're labeled secondary and primary. So that'll be cool. That'll be our first attempt. These are of course, firewalls. So they have two 10, 100 NICs over here. Typically you'd have the outside network. So the internet, let's say, and then the inside network, you know, your actual local network that the firewall's protecting. These guys are equipped with additional NICs. The whole point of getting this hub is we can actually get a couple of these NICs on the same hub network, something like this. And this is actually another way to configure failover. That'll be bonus points if we can get this one working. So simple. From right to left, power, of course. These light blue RJ45s are serial console cables, so we can interact with the PIX firewall units. This is, of course, our high-speed serial failover cable. The dark blue ones are the outside network. These are going to my existing home network. They're both on that network. The secondary isn't gonna be doing anything with any networks until the serial cable tells it to do so. But it needs to be on both networks so that it can take over. Here's a little switch for our inside networks. Both of them are on it. This blue guy here is the Ubuntu machine that we're gonna test with. I know this little TP-Link switch is kind of ruining the Cisco vibe here. I'm gonna need to find an era appropriate switch to go with all this gear. Too easy. Fire up the primary and the secondary. Let's go see what they're doing over the serial console. Right away, we've got problems. This is the standby failover unit and it's really unhappy. It knows it's connected to a primary, but the PixOS version is different. The OS version needs to be exactly the same. So let's see here. It's got version 6.33, and here's the primary. It's got 634. They have to be identical. So my primary is already configured the way I like it. I'm gonna try to find this version to flash to the secondary. Found a copy of the Cisco Pix 500 series security appliances product CD on archive.org and it has 634. The way you flash these PIX machines is with these binary files and you host them over TFTP. So I've got this machine on my network that is hosting a bunch of the other stuff I was messing with when I was playing with these PIX before. And I've got PIX 634, which should be the same version that's on the primary. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna power cycle the secondary. And you can see it says, break or escape to interrupt. Now we're in monitor mode. I guess sort of like Rammon on the 2600. 
this is all going to look very similar to the iOS we were messing with before, but it's totally, it's a totally different operating system. They just, they feel the same. So let's see, we give this thing its own address. We tell it about the TFCP server, which happens to be host 82. We tell it the file to download. For good measure, we're going to ping that TFTP server. Our success rate is 0%. I always forget this. Monitor mode defaults to NIC 1. I had my network on NIC 0, and so I just swapped them. You can control it in that monitor mode by changing the interface, but I just swapped the cords here real quick, and then I'll forget to swap them back. 80% success rate. Good enough for me. And then I think you just type TFTP. It uses all those settings. Yep, it's downloading the file. Fully flashed just a few moments later. And now version 634, just what we want. Easy as that. Okay, this is so funny. It says CR PIX1. I had set my other one up as Clab Retro CR PIX1. And so I'm sitting here looking at it like, did I just flash the primary? But no, this is the secondary. And here's the primary screen. Here's the primary connection. And this is exactly what we want to see. The moment that secondary came online, it said sync started. And then it said sync completed, which means I believe this one is acting as a full secondary. The primary pushed its config down to it. Let's get those ethernet cables hooked up back the right way and we'll try a failover test. This is also what we want to see. On the top, you see that ACT light. That stands for active. On the bottom, it's not lit because that's the secondary. When we do a failover, that secondary, it will go active. Top will go off. Very exciting. Just for good measure, we're on the primary now. We can say show failover. And it knows this toast is the primary. And then it knows about the other one. And it also mentions something about stateful failover, unconfigured. So when these things fail over on the serial cable, it's going to lose all information. All the clients are going to lose all their connections. They're going to have to reestablish anything they were already doing. I'm going to have that Ubuntu machine pinging away, and that's just going to fail in timeout. Then the failover will take place, and the Ubuntu machine will have connectivity again. When we move to the hub, and we start using those Ethernet cables on the additional NIC, we can look at something called stateful failover, and no client connections are going to be lost because the PICS units are keeping them in sync together. On the secondary, show failover. Same story in reverse. This host, secondary standby, other host, primary. We're looking at the secondary. I've got Ubuntu on the network, pinging away at the internet. I'm gonna literally pull the physical power cable out of the primary to simulate a massive failure. We'll see what happens. I think there's a pull time of like 15 seconds before the secondary notices. Check this out. It says this host, secondary active, failover is on, cable status, other side powered off, and we are pinging away at Google. Yes. I can't believe this worked. The secondary down there has become active. Primary, of course, has no power at all. So that's why the secondary needed to be on the inside network. It needed to be on the outside network. The primary had pushed its config to the secondary. I don't know how often it does that, but it had it. This thing turned off a few seconds later. This one took over and the Ubuntu machine is still pinging away. So cool. Let's see what it does when the primary comes back online. Primary is booting up here. Let's do show failover. This host is up, but it's in standby mode now. And the secondary is still active. I think we can programmatically fail back over to this one. All right, we're on the primary host, which is in standby. I realize it's probably a nightmare to follow along with this. But we should be able to say failover active and bring all the activity back to this primary top unit. Yeah, I don't know, I'm getting conflicting information. I'm just going to turn off the secondary. So I thought traffic would be interrupted, but I must have been wrong because it's pinging away. And yeah, check it out. The primary host is active now. So cool. We are operating with high availability down here. Let's say for some reason you don't want to spend 11 bucks on eBay for this cable. Obviously, I don't understand why you wouldn't. It's my understanding that theoretically, 
we can get this hub involved. And we can put some of our little bonus NICs here on their own little failover network and get them talking to each other without the serial cable. Got this rigged up so we can watch the whole stack come to life at once. Fantastic. I forgot to point out before someone mentions it, I don't need a hub at all for this. I can just use a patch cable, but I think you'll agree this is obviously way cooler. I have been perusing the literature and I have been lying to you and myself this entire time. You definitely need this cable no matter what. That's a requirement. But I was right about the stateful stuff. When you configure this properly, they pass client state between one another. And when you fail over, an application doesn't have to reestablish any connections. We might just not have noticed that with my simple ping test because it's obviously restarting a connection all the time. And maybe even with stateless failover, it happened so fast that the ping thing didn't notice. But uh, you know, I can't complain. This is obviously a better setup. There's more stuff hooked up. Promised I'd show you this. Got it all cleaned up pretty good and no markings. But if we take it out and flip it over, it is of course a Celeron from 1998, which is the year that the Celeron came out and the PIX reports it as a Pentium 2 because probably it basically is. I just spent the last like 40 minutes failing these back and forth amongst each other. <laughs> really fun. I'm super glad I was able to get this to work. Totally misunderstood that you of course always need the cable. So I'll save the stateful link with the ethernet cable for another day. Not that exciting once I saw how well the basic failover was working. We didn't put the hub or the router to work very hard, but I'm really happy to have them in the collection and I'll have to come up with a few use cases to get these things going and play with them. We have a lot more to explore in terms of management. We could set up an SNMP server and get some metrics from this, probably from the 2600 module. I've got some expansion modules on the way for this. It'd be nice to also get some sort of T1 setup going so I could use those modules and play around with them. But we accomplished what we came for, which was a successful PIX firewall failover back and forth. Very exciting. I already alluded to the Cisco 7200 series gear I've started to pick up. So there will definitely be more videos on, I don't want to say retro networking, but older gear, 20 plus year old gear. I hope you had a good time following along as I dove into some of the Cisco gear and learned a little bit about it. I always like playing around with it and getting it all set up. Definitely going to have to explore getting more of these fast hubs and stacking those. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. I've got more content on the way. And if you'd really like to support the channel and help me pick up more gear like this, I have a Patreon where I do behind the scenes type videos, workshop tours, eBay hauls, that sort of thing. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I hope I see you in the next one.